top of the hour, so I think we'll get started. Uh, my name is Candace Granberg. I'm a pediatric urologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And I want to start off by thanking Dr. Kopp, um, Michelle, and the entire team that's put together the Ped Zero Flow lecture series. This is a fantastic opportunity for the trainees to get standardized education across the country, no matter where they are in their training, whether you're a resident or a fellow. And I think it's going to be extremely useful moving forward. We're all excited to be a part of it. So thanks for the opportunity to speak. I chose to talk about testicular tumors. I'm very passionate about urologic oncology. Before deciding on PEDS, I really thought I was going to be a uro-oncologist and found out that PEDS was my passion. And it's exciting that we can take care of cancer in kids as well. So there's, there's a lot that can go into this talk. So I'll try to stick just to the pediatric testicular tumors, knowing that there's a lot more out there. We'll have Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, throw them in the Q&A portion of Zoom and I'll address them all at the end just so I don't have to toggle between and lose where we're at in the talk. So we'll get started. I have no disclosures, except I would like to point out that it is a balmy 68 and cloudy here in Rochester, which in fact is four degrees warmer than San Francisco right now. So you can see this is time stamped 5.15 p.m. today. Uh, it was warmer here in Rochester than, than in San Francisco. So yes, looks like San Francisco is sunnier, but it's because our sun is setting right now. It's a little later in the day. And then welcome to everybody out on the East Coast as well. So the objectives for my talk today, I'm going to talk about the risk factors for testis tumors, review the types of pediatric testis tumors, and then the management of, of testis tumors in kids, and then we'll save some time at the end for some questions. So overall incidence of testicular cancer, it's a bimodal distribution. The first is in the first year of life, more towards the first few months of life. And then the second and bigger peak is in adolescence and young adulthood. So this was a recent review of the SEER registries, and you can see on the left side of your screen, this is the younger group, the prepubertal group, and they break it down by um, category because it does vary by incidence. And keep in mind on the uh, y-axis, the incidence of rate per million is different in the prepubertals versus the pubertals because obviously this is much, much higher. So it can range anywhere from about one and a half to three and a half per million in the first um, decade and a half of life. And then it's as, as low as 20 per million all the way up to almost 130 per million uh, in the adolescent and young adult uh, age groups. Overwhelmingly, germ cells are much more common than non-germ cells in kids. And benign are, again, overwhelmingly more common than malignant, different than the uh, adolescent young adult population. Uh, the risk factors for testicular cancer, there's several, and there's several that are in the works that they're looking at. So I just listed here some that are known. First and foremost, cryptorchidism. You'll probably learned about that or will learn about that in the cryptorchidism lecture. Um, having a personal history of testis cancer puts you at risk of contralateral. Having precancerous lesions, ITGCN, in, in your testicle puts you at risk. Uh, family history of testis cancer, DSD, and question microlithiasis. Those are the three that I'm going to talk about on separate slides here. So is there a familial association with testis cancer? That seems to be the first thing that parents worry about when either their child is diagnosed or if they have a history themselves. So this was a, a large study in the Swedish Cancer Database where they did identify an increased risk uh, of testicular cancer if a family member was affected. So if one family member had testicular cancer, the risk ratio was, relative risk was five times, and it was equal between seminoma and non-seminoma. If there were two family members with testicular cancer, especially non-seminoma, that skyrockets up to a relative risk of 33. Uh, the risk is higher if it's the brother affected versus than if it was the father, so from brother to brother versus father to son. And interestingly, if you look just at seminoma, it seemed that that was more associated with some familial and discordant cancers, such as breast endometrial, um, other types of cancers, which brings the question of what other environmental factors or second hit hypotheses might be associated with seminoma versus the non-seminomas. What about dysgenetic testes and testicular cancer? The known risk factor is the part of the Y chromosome that puts it at risk. Now, lots of evolving uh, research is showing that there's particular spots within the Y chromosome, so it's not just that Y chromosome where there's a problem, it's specific areas that they can isolate now. And realistically, it's because the gonad is dysgenetic. It's an abnormal gonad. So if the 
the prevalence of germ cell tumors is about 12% if it is a dysgenetic gonad. And if they do have gonadoblastoma, there's, you know, a third of them will be bilateral. So this picture here on your screen, that's a dysgenetic gonad in a child who had a mosaic form 46XY, 45XO with various percentages on each side. Um, so again, with a dysgenetic gonad, the risk is higher. This is a table, if you really like things in table form, that'll show you what is the DSD category, and then what is the estimated tumor prevalence. That'll just help drive discussions with families, um, with your multidisciplinary teams when you have your DSD clinic to make decisions and share decision-making on moving forward with what is the true risk, something that's been controversial in the past. Specifically with CAAS, so if you look at complete androgen insensitivity and risk of testicular cancer, Let's say you're doing a hernia repair in a girl and out pop two gonads that look like this in their testicles. What are you going to do? You're not gonna take them out. Um, the derm cell numbers rapidly decline with time, significantly within the first year of life and quickly thereafter. So it's pretty rare to find a, a precursor to cancer in prepubertal children. And the overall estimated risk of either a precursor or a malignancy in this category can range from 5% to 14% in some series. So the, the rule that we have now, what we tell families with our shared decision making and our multidisciplinary teams is defer the gonadectomy until the child is old enough to make their own decision um, and weigh in and if they even want to have it done. We leave them in there so that they can have their secondary sex characteristics. Um, there's no reason to go in and take them out early to decrease that risk of cancer because it's extremely, extremely low. And there's certainly been some lawsuits and lots of discussion around doing surgery on gonads in children before they are able to weigh in. What about microlithiasis? Yet another hot topic with testicular cancer, and this is going to be specific to kids. So a lot of this has been extrapolated from the adult population, the military series where they're just looking at microlithiasis. So this was actually a, a study with six large children's hospitals. They looked at over 37,000 ultrasounds, and the overall rate of microlithiasis was almost 3%, 22% unilateral, huge percent bilateral, 78%. And then they looked at risk of tumor formation. So the risk of a germ cell tumor, which a malignant germ cell tumor, which is the one you'd be worried about, is actually quite high if there was microlithiasis present versus if there wasn't. And so this is something that doesn't necessarily say if there's microlithiasis, here's your risk of cancer, but it might direct screening. So the take home point from this paper was clearly we need a prospective study. We're going to need multiple hospitals involved and we need to follow them for a very long time, obviously through that second peak of the incidence of cancer to see if this really bodes true for children that have the incidental diagnosis of microlithiasis when they're getting that testicular ultrasound done for something else in childhood but certainly in a pediatric series, this is elevated. So now moving into the tumors themselves. A yolk sac tumor is the most common prepubertal testicular neoplasm. It's rarely metastatic. 90% of these are stage one, which is great, which means they're a great one to cure with just one surgery. Again, they often have an elevated AFP, and we'll talk about that on the next slide. So they do need a staging evaluation just to ensure that they are stage one. So they will get that chest, uh, abdomen, pelvis CT scan at some point, whether it's, you know, earlier at that second follow-up visit, again, working with your pediatric oncology team. And the treatment universally is gonna be an orchiectomy and that should be curative if they're stage one. So here's a path picture along the side. I know they don't typically test path, especially on the oral boards anymore, but if, if it comes up on your in-service exam, I call these nuggets, where you're gonna get a little piece of information that's gonna stick with you and you're gonna say, I remember it from that one talk. So if, you're, if you like to be the type that likes to guess and put something in the chat column, you can. If you know what the, the pathognomonic finding on a yolk sac tumor is on pathology, it's that guy right there. And that's the Schiller Duval body. So if that comes up on the in-service, you're welcome. All right. AFP is produced by a few different things, and that's why it's present in normal babies, and then it goes down in the first year of life. Half-life is five days, another common question. You'll either get pimped on or it'll show up on your in-service exam. And it may not go back down to baseline until about six or eight months of age. If it's elevated, it can persist even in the whole first year of life. So this table is for term babies. If you have a preemie, these levels will be different because it has to be adjusted to their gestational age. 
So the COG has its own staging of germ cell tumors, so it's separate from what you would see in the NCCN tables. Um, so if it's limited to the testis, you completely resect with your orchiectomy. It's not extending into the spermatic cord. Your markers are normal. There's no evidence of spread. That's stage one. They're doing great. Realistically, you don't even have to keep following them with imaging and keep exposing them to radiation, blood draws, etc. Obviously, as the stages go up, they're going to have entering different protocols for chemotherapy and such if they're going to start getting into stage two, stage three, stage four. Mature teratoma is the most common benign prepubertal testis tumor. These kids do not have elevation of their serum tumor markers. And again, treatment is surgery. Now we will talk a little bit later in this lecture about partial versus radical orchiectomy, but if feasible, this is a great candidate because again, it's overwhelmingly benign, very rare, obviously rare case reports of a malignant teratoma um, in a child, but overwhelmingly benign. So this is a kiddo who came at about four months of age to my clinic, and he just came in with a swelling on his well-child visit. So no concern prenatally, nothing on his first few visits. And on the right side, you can see just this big cystic area, and it's really compressing the testicular parenchyma. And it's really impressive how much you can get a squish of a kidney or a testicle in a kid, and then things can bounce back. So if you can salvage this testicle, there's a chance that this could be normal parenchyma in follow-up. So you always ask yourself, can I do a partial orchiectomy in this child, yes or no? So right testis versus left, and then I just put them side by side so you could see the difference. Nice, homogenous, beautiful testicle, and then this huge cystic area. There's no flow in here. So it seemed like it could just be a cyst. It could be something else. So took them to the OR and, you know, delivered the testicle, wrapped everything just like you're going to do, you know, a standard uh, radical orchiectomy prep in the field, cut the tunic albuginia overlying the cystic mass, was able to get it out completely down to itself and then just took it out. So as one of my bosses always says, respect the cyst. The last thing you want to do is rupture either a kidney tumor, any sort of intra-abdominal tumor, much less a testicular tumor. So got this out on block and under the microscope, it ended up being a teratoma. So it was just a, a cystic teratoma with just one big cyst, uh, margins negative. And here's this follow-up. So I always want to prove to my residents, like, yes, I promise this testicle is going to grow back, you know, and it's going to bounce back and get some parenchyma. And sure enough, this is the one um, that was operated on. This is the normal testicle. Size-wise, they're very similar. We'll have to see how that bodes out through puberty. But rest assured, we did, I feel like we did him some justice by saving some parenchyma on that side. Late cell tumors, they're the most common gonadostromal tumor that you'd see in the kid. It's again, overwhelmingly benign in prepubertal kids. It can secrete testosterone. So how might this patient present to you in clinic? They can have precocious puberty. They can have gynecomastia. So if a kid comes in with precocious puberty to our endocrine colleagues and they feel a mass, these are one of the things they'd be thinking of. So again, treatment is surgery. And if you can attempt a partial, great, because there's no reason to be concerned about leaving the, the rest of the testicle behind. Another nugget, when you're taking your in-service, if this pops up, or if it's even just in question form, one of the, what are these things right here that you would see in a latex cell tumor? Jeopardy style, Frankie's crystals. So trying to take a picture of this with your brain, remember this if it pops up. If you get it right, you're welcome. All right, moving on to another one, Sertoli cell tumor. So these are pretty rare. They're less than 1% of all testis tumors, kids and adults. And so it's hard to find a big series. This was actually a recent big series, 435 patients, 50 of them had metastatic disease. So they say, why would you get metastatic disease, especially if this is something kind of a cousin to the latex cell tumor? So they looked at some risk factors. So older patients and their cutoff was 27 and a half years old, bigger tumor, their cutoff was 24 millimeters. If there's necrosis, if it extends into the spermatic cord, and then obviously there are, are path friends if they identify endolymphatic invasion or a high metodic index, those were more likely to lead to metastatic, to be associated with metastatic disease. So this might drive your decision making in a child. Again, our kids are under 27 and a half years old, but if you see any of these other things. So if there's no risk factors, surgery only, you don't have to keep scanning these kids and radiating their ret retroperitoneum. If they do have these risk factors, yes, you want to stage them appropriately. Um, and be getting follow-up imaging so that they don't have a recurrence that you're missing. There's a variant of that Sertoli cell tumor called a large cell calcifying Sertoli cell tumor, or an LCCSCT. They have a nice acronym for that. Um, and this is something that can be bilateral in 25%. It can be multiple tumors within one testicle. 
And again, these kids can show up with gynecomastia. A third of them can carry a genetic disorder. So again, here's the nuggets for, for the Sertoli cell tumor, if it's a large cell calcifying, what couple of syndromes is this associated with that you should be looking for? So one is the Carney complex, very common neurologic you know, syndrome that we like to follow. So it's autosomal dominant. dominant. You'll see these kids that can have some litigenies on their face, actually all over their body. Um, they can have myxomas. So really the cardiac myxoma is the one that's concerning. You've got to follow these kids with an echo uh, to make sure that they don't have any cardiac issues. Um, the endocrine tumors are something is why we're seeing them or why our endocrine colleagues are following them is they can have uh, adenomas that are producing growth hormone, but then these testicular tumors are what we're following because if they can become big or they're space occupying or they're causing any hormonal issues, then we might need to do a little hormonal blockade. You also want to make sure you're not missing any thyroid cancers. They're coming for their physical exams and then schwannomas. So these kids need to have an annual testicular ultrasound. I follow a couple of these kids. They come in every year. They get their testicular ultrasound. We do an exam. I caution them to make sure they're doing their self exams once a month in the shower. Um, if it's growing or if they develop gynecomastia, that's when you talk about doing an orchiectomy or a partial orchiectomy. You don't want them to have premature epithelial fusion. We don't want them to be shorter than they should be. Um, if it's not rapidly growing or if the gynecomastia is mild, then you can treat them with the drug rather than surgery. So it's something that we work very closely with our endocrine colleagues to make sure we're offering the appropriate treatment for the appropriate child. Another syndrome associated with these are putz jaeger syndrome. So it's another autosomal dominant. And again, we're looking for what do we need to do to follow these kids to catch things early. So GI polyps, that can lead to polyposis and take over their colon. Um, they also have some skin findings. And then it is a cancer predisposition syndrome. So multiple cancers that these families are being screened with moving forward, or if this is the index patient, you wanna give them some genetic counseling for their family members as they move forward. Colorectal, gastric, pancreatic, breast, ovarian, and again, these sex cord stromal tumors. And again, same thing with the uh, Carney complex is if they're having any issues with gynecomastia, we can talk about how we're gonna treat if something shows up. So again, they're coming in annual testicular exam, annual ultrasounds. The big question when they become a grown up, I need to hand them over to one of my adult colleagues who's gonna do the same and, and follow them moving forward. So this is a, another kind of rare one, but I've seen it a few times in my albeit short career already. So juvenile granulosa cell tumors. They present in infancy, almost always within the first you know, month or two of life, it's pretty early. They're very similar to the ovarian granulosa cell tumors, which are, I feel like, much more well-studied. And again, the treatment overwhelmingly is surgery. If possible, you can try to do a partial, which is great. So this is a kiddo I saw, again, he was actually born uh, with what they felt was kind of a firmer testicle, and then he got referred out to us at a couple weeks of life. And so on the ultrasound, you can see there's flow within this mass, so heterogeneous mass that's completely encapsulated by testicular parenchyma. And then on cut section, you can see, I mean, there was really just the thinnest rim of parenchyma left. There was really no salvaging this testis compared to the cyst that you saw earlier. So again, it was really solid. It wasn't nice and smooth, like you could shell it out or enucleate it. And so for this child, he actually ended up getting a radical orchiectomy. So the question of what to do with this is something that's kind of on the horizon is Dicer-1 syndrome, another autosomal dominant syndrome. And the problem that Dicer-1 has is if you have a pathogenic germline variant in Dicer-1, it can ruin the microRNA processing and it leads to a lot of different uh, cancers. And so the hallmark neoplasm, which kind of started the database where they're following these Dicer-1 kids, is this pleuropulmonary blastoma. So if somebody has a pleuropulmonary blastoma, they get entered into this database and now all of a sudden they're screening for all the other cancers. And the reasons we should be following this from, from urology is they're at risk for Wilms tumor, rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. There's all sorts of um, pediatric malignancies from a GU standpoint that we should be aware of. But again, it's somewhat understudied in testicular juvenile granulosa cell tumors because there's just not that many. I mean, up until a decade ago, there were only 50 case reports of juvenile granulosa cell tumors in the testicle, much more in the ovarian world. So there's actually a huge ovarian and testicular stromal tumor database now where they all get entered and then followed. So the question is, is if you have a kid with a juvenile granulosa cell tumor, what I do for mine, again, I've seen a couple, I've sent them to my genetics colleagues, they talk to the family, do you want to enter into a testing and then potentially test family members so it can direct the surveillance strategies moving forward. 
This one's also pretty rare. Again, I've seen it a few times, but it's, it's, it's an epidermoid cyst. And so it's thought to be actually along the spectrum of a teratoma. It's just that it's monodermal. It just has one cell origin rather than three. And the classic image that you'll see is this onion skin. And so it's layers of this keratinous debris that just layer upon layer and they become very space occupying. They can really compress the testicular parenchyma. Um, and, but they're benign. So again, this is a perfect candidate for a testis sparing surgery. And it's curative if you take it out all the way. I've never seen it bilateral, but it can occur. Um, but it's pretty classic on, again, it's gonna be a target lesion almost where it's just these layers. So keep that in mind. You may see that again sometime. Another thing we sometimes see in kids is a non-testis primary. So the unfortunate situation where somebody's got lymphoma or leukemia and they're in remission and all of a sudden they show up with testicular mass is the first thing we think of is, oh no, they've, they've recurred. Um, there's a lot of other rare case reports of other non-testis primaries that can go to the testicle. We don't typically routinely biopsy, especially the le leukemia lymphomas, unless it's found after remission and we're just there to confirm that it's a recurrence. So, this is a child who had a recurrence of his B-cell lymphoma. This is his right testicle, which looks fairly normal, but on the left, it's just really kind of lobular and, and it's, it had the same flow as the other side. It was just very spotty. Um, it was significantly enlarged compared to the right side. And sure enough, on his PET scan, this poor child has huge positivity in that testicle um, on the cord on that side. He had a breast lesion, retroperitoneal mass. It was just quite sad. So actual disease, disease everywhere. The postpubertals really need to be treated on adult protocols. So there's NCCN guidelines based on thousands of men with great long-term follow-up and outcomes where they've tweaked things perfectly. So realistically, these kids, so these are the pubertal kids that are pubertal or postpubertal that have the adult type tumors, we don't want to experiment with them. So we really need to put them into our, our clinics where we have adolescent young adult clinics, multidisciplinary where you've got, you know, child psych involved if they're concerned about losing a testicle, you know, you're talking about fertility preservation. Um, and then you have your GU oncologists and the medical oncologists who can talk about the side effects of chemotherapy and, and if they need radiation, what, what to expect. Um, there are, there's one COG protocol out there that's sort of a low risk testicular cancer protocol that's very much debated between the adult and the pediatric um, oncologists because it's trying to substitute carboplatin for cisplatin, which the adults say isn't gonna work as well, but the peds say let's give them something less risky. So it really has to be something as an institution, you have to be on the same page that if a kid walks through the door and he's 16 and he falls into one of these age groups where he could go on a peds or an adult protocol that everybody agrees what to do. So, so we have that infrastructure here, which is great. We have communication between our pediatric and our adult uh, GU oncologists to make sure that we're entering kids onto the right protocol. So there is actually a phase three trial of accelerated BEP. This is a COG trial um, and it's for the intermediate and poor risk metastatic germ cell tumors. They're still getting the right drugs. They're just getting it on a different cycle. So we're trying to see if you accelerate it if it's going to have a better outcome and then it can kind of speed them up and get them to the next step faster um, without the toxicity and so this is is actively accruing we're accruing here we just entered our first patient a few weeks ago um, and the age group is 11 to like 45 so this is not just for kids so if you're seeing adult cancer patients and they're intermediate or poor risk and they're metastatic then you can certainly see if your institution offers this protocol so talking about surgery um, testis sparing surgery is, is very much in vogue when it comes to benign masses. And so it's something that you have to keep in mind because any parenchyma that you save is parenchyma that can work. And so if you can save it, you should. So the, the best candidates is if it's an intertesticular mass, they've got normal serum tumor markers, it's feasible to get it all out. You're not going to leave anything behind. You're not going to spill tumor. And then you have frozen section analysis at your hospital. The last thing you want to do is take something out, find out that it's a yolk sac, it was extending elsewhere, and you didn't get it all, and you have to go back. So you have to have frozen section analysis right then and there. Um, the corroborating findings on final versus frozen is very good for most of these masses. And in the adults, they looked at a size cutoff of two centimeters to say if it's bigger than two centimeters, they're not a candidate uh, for testis sparing surgery. 
It doesn't seem to relate to kids because again, there's gonna be different size of the testicle in relation to how big the child is. And so if it's feasible, really the size doesn't matter. You can, in a kid that meets the criteria for, this is probably gonna be a benign tumor. You look at something like this and say, is there any way that you can do testis sparing surgery? No, I mean, this encompasses the entire testicle. So the last thing you're gonna do is dig around and, and leave anything behind. So again, if it meets criteria, yes. If it doesn't meet criteria, you're gonna do your standard inguinal incision. If it's too big, you might have to hockey stick it to extend it to get um, the entire tumor out on block. So just another example of a completely, encaps it's completely encompassing the testicle, flow throughout, you're gonna to have to take the whole testicle on block and on cut section, there was no way you're gonna save this testicle. And this one's actually interesting. I have a, I have a 3D model of the, the testicle and the tumor because the child thought it would be pretty interesting. And so we did a surface scan 3D model of this tumor and this is actually the size that it was so they can hold in their hand and say, wow, my tumor was this big. Um, so again, this is on the outside, this is at the cut section on the inside just to see the different components. This one ended up being mostly teratoma, but it had a focus of uh, embryonal and actually choreo. And so we find these 3D models to be great for teaching purposes. The teenagers seem to become involved more when they can see what's happening on the inside. So I just thought this was interesting because it related to the picture that, that you guys see there. What about scrotal violation? It's like the worst thing you can possibly think of is did I just ruin this kid's life because you went into something thinking that it wasn't, it was just a hydrocele or something and sure enough you found a testicular tumor. There is a higher risk of local recurrence if you violate the scrotum versus if you don't. So it's 2.5% versus zero, but it is statistically significant. But rest assured, there's no increased risk of subsequent metastases. And there's no impact on survival. And this is just in the short term, three to five years. We've got to follow this out longer. But it's not a death sentence. So it's something that you can, you can address, but it's, it's not a death sentence. So it's not something they should panic. And so the ABCs should be always be calm. So don't panic in the operating room. If it happens, you're going to have some shared decision making. So if it's a seminoma, you're probably going to talk to your multidisciplinary team about local radiation to that area on the scrotum. If it's a non-seminoma, you go and ex excise the scar, typically at the time you're already doing their post chemo or PLND anyway, and so it's not an extra surgery if you were headed down that path anyway, and about 10% of them will have residual tumor in the scar. An optimist would say there's a 90% chance that there's not gonna be residual tumor there. Again, that's just one study, um, because there's always the option for observation then. You can always offer that, but you have to worry about loss of follow-up all the time in this population. The last thing you want to do is send them out the door knowing that there was scrotal violation without a plan. So if they, if they are going to be coming back, if it's trustworthy that they will, then you could consider it. Um, but otherwise, it's path dependent. RPL and D. So I won't go into detail about this because we're going to be, I'll tell you at the end that we've got another talk coming up on that soon. But it's a template dissection. There's no difference whether this is a 16-year-old or this is a 32-year-old. We could talk all day about, you know, the complications from our PLND and how do you prevent them. So realistically, it should be done by a high volume GU Wonk fellowship trained surgeon. The complication rates are lower in the hands of higher volume surgeons. That's been, that's been published. So you have to consider where you're at and say, is this something that could be co-surgeon with a GU Wonk fellowship trained surgeon to do this child's case? Or do I refer it out? You have to do what's best for the child because are you going to be able to take out this tumor that's completely plastered to the IVC and throw in an IVC tube graft on your own at a standalone pediatric hospital? Or do you need a vascular surgeon? Do you need somebody to help move the liver out of the way? Are you going to be resecting jejunum? There's lots of surprises you can have from some of these really sticky masses and you want to make sure you load the boat and you have the right people. So we're very lucky here that we are a peds hospital within an adult hospital that I can call my oncology fellowship trained colleagues, we can call the liver surgeon, the vascular surgeon, we have everybody on board, and they do these cases every week. When you looked at the overall case logs of things that were turned in from, from graduates and people recertifying, it's shocking that um, a great number of our PLNDs are done at places that only do one or two a year. And you say to yourself, if that's my family member, is that what I want? Is somebody who does something once or twice a year or someone who's doing it once or twice a week? So they've talked about, you know, referral centers for specific to uh, RPLNDs, both primary and uh, post-chemo. 
for complication rates, transfusion rates, nerve sparing abilities. Um, so really think about that as you're heading into practice of, of who you have available, depending on what you're doing and where's the best place for them. So here's another scan of a kiddo who had this, this post chemo mass in his retroperitoneum. And this is this the coronal view. And again, it's, it's right up against the bottom of the kidney. It's right next to vessels. And the way we were taught and the way that my colleagues here that are GU Onc fellowship trained surgeons is you should be able to floss your finger behind the vena cava, floss your finger behind that aorta. You should be able to lick the anterior surface of the anterior spinous ligament. That's how clean it should be. We're not plucking nodes, we're dissecting nodes. So there's a difference in lymph node sampling versus lymph node dissection. And so we're really sticking to the template boundaries to get every single potential lymph node out because that's going to be their cure, their best chance at cure, and decrease their imaging as they're moving forward. So just a plug for good surgery because that's why we're all here. We always have to discuss testicular prostheses with our patients. Now again, this is a bimodal distribution. So you're not gonna put a prosthesis in a baby. You don't put a prosthesis in a growing child who's prepubertal, but you certainly discuss it in the postpubertal child. I always talk to the kids that are either, you know, have testicular torsion, a neonatal torsion. I tell the parents as they grow, if they're interested in a prosthesis, bring them back when they're pubertal and we can talk. Um, but it's not something that you have to put it in and keep upsizing it so that the scrotum will stretch enough for their pubertal size. We've even had some kids that are, you know, had bilateral neonatal torsion, which is super sad, come in and they can get their prosthesis put in at puberty. So there's two different types. There's a silicone and the saline. It just depends on how you were trained and what your institution carries and what you prefer when you go off into practice. Personally, we use the silicone prostheses here. They feel realistic. They can be sized appropriately. There was a back order issue for a while, which was kind of concerning, um, but it doesn't seem to have any risk of, of of leakage and the concerns they had for the silicone breast implants years ago, um, but it's something that we definitely talk to our patients about pre-op. You can talk about a post-op in their follow-ups and find the right time when you're going to be able to put that in. I tried to start this Twitter campaign long ago called hashtag cups for everyone because I firmly believe that anybody who's playing a stick or contact sport should be wearing a cup to protect their testicles. So you know, the comment I typically get from boys is they're not comfortable, I can't move as quickly, and so there's a couple new companies, and I'm not at any way, in any way associated with these companies. I'm just a proponent of Cups for Everyone. So this is one company that claims to have, you know, more natural position, it's more comfortable, you can move better, because the reasons the boys are telling me they don't want to wear them is because it's, it's impinging their movement and it doesn't fit well in their uniform. So this is one, it's called the Nutty Buddy, not to be confused with the Nutty Buddy that I grew up with. These are delicious, by the way. Um, but this is just one company that you can look into so that the limiting factor is not the plastic cup down the street doesn't fit well, so I'm not wearing it, especially if they only have a solitary testicle. This is another company, Armored Nutshells. This one's Kevlar. I mean, this guy's selling them to military, to the police SWAT teams. Um, there used to be a video on this website, I'm not sure if it's still there, where he was taking a nine millimeter to the cup himself to show how strong it was and it didn't even dent it. So it's impressive. And again, if you looked at the cost of this, it's $125, but it is to protect their testicle. And so anytime I do an orchiectomy, I talk to the child, you know, both pre and post-op about wearing protection. You wouldn't go into a football game without a helmet on. You really need to protect a solitary organ, whether it's a kidney, whether it's a testicle and wear a cup. So if we can make the, the hashtag go, that would be fantastic. Um, so what about survivors? So when we look at fertility rates, everyone talks about fertility, but we also have to look at paternity. So it's, it's one thing, you know, if you have the ability to have a child, but are they really fathering a child? And so there's a study that looked at, a meta-analysis looked at, you know, are they able to become a father after specifically just testicular cancer treatment? And interestingly, 7% of them were azospermic before they even started treatment. Only 14% of them did sperm banking before. The overall conception rate was 22%, despite 52% that attempted it. And then the live birth rate was only 37%. And of those, 32% had to use um, alternative methods like ICSI or IVF. So, you know, I think it's, it's tough because this is a number nobody wants to see. Why did only 14% undergo sperm banking before treatment? And so I think it's, it's a glaring hole that we have in the discussion points for we have to do this we have to do this now you have to have surgery we need to bank and so the, the question is is who's approaching the patient 
specific to kids, it's a very tenuous time in the teenage years of talking about you're gonna do you want to have baby someday? They're 14, 15, 16, they may not be thinking about that. But when you look at survivors and you ask what's most important to you, number one was I want to survive, I want to beat the cancer. Number two is they're worried about fertility. And so when they look backwards, they wish they would have had that discussion or wish it would have been offered. And so it's something we have to think about. So there are certainly some teenage boys we care for who don't either want to or they have religious reasons that they can't um, give a semen sample themselves. And so we do certainly talk about doing, you know, if we can do back table dissection of the normal parenchyma when you're taking out a testicle to see if there are sperm present and then you can do cryopreservation. Um, there's certainly protocols now for pre and post pubertal testicular tissue cryopreservation. If your institution has an oncofertility fertility team that offers that, you know, there's a huge IRB for it and you have to go through all of the hoops that are involved. But again, it's something that we have to keep in mind in the pre-op counseling before you go off and take them, take them because again, this is variable. These percentages are variable depending on, was it just an orchiectomy? Did they get BEP? Did they get radiation? Um, so it certainly, you know, can be all over the map depending on what their treatment was, but these are just overall numbers. And again, something to keep in mind. So what about gonadal function? Again, this is something that can be all over the map. Some will say that everything's fine. Some will say just the LH is impaired, but this, this one study said there was an odds ratio of 6.9 for hypogonadism and 36% of survivors of testicular cancer. And all we're saying is, yes, we need to study it more, but it justifies screening of survivors to ensure, you know, if it was, you know, early in life, did they go through puberty appropriately? You know, are they having their secondary sex characteristics? Are they able to produce a sample? Do they have sperm? Do they have, you know, the right hormone levels? Um, so something to keep in mind in the survivorship clinics that your adolescent young adult centers should have. I'm going to put in a plug for more learning about testicular cancer. So the SPU Live is going to be on Saturday, June 27th, and we have a session from 5.45 to 6.45 p.m. This is the big AUA Live weekend as well. And so we have John Ruth, who's going to talk about RPLND and paratestis, you know, rhabdomyosarcoma, which I didn't even touch in this because it's not primary testicular. I'll be talking about the role of RPLND in adolescent uh, testicular germ cell tumors. And then Dr. Saltzman is going to talk about testis variant surgery in more detail. And then we're going to have a panel. We have cases. Dr. Ross is going to leave a great discussion. So just if you want to put that on your calendar, if you're like, this is my jam, I love testicular cancer, I think it'll be interesting. And with that, I left plenty of time for some questions and discussion. This is my Twitter handle if you want to follow me uh, or if you want to ask me questions down the road, send me messages. I'm gonna look at the Q&A section up here, or Q&A, because I know that there's some questions that popped up here. So I'll go through these questions first, and then if there's more that pop up, we'll get there. So the first question was, do you insert prosthesis through an inguinal or a scrotal incision? So I, you know, depending on the situation, because I have some non-cancer situations, and then we have our cancer situations. So if we've done a radical orchiectomy through the inguinal, then I pop it right through the inguinal incision. Um, again, I use the silicone prosthesis, so it's got that little mesh tab on the one side. So you can invert the scrotum all the way up to your inguinal incision and do that, your tacking stitch down there, um, and then bring it down where it needs to go. And then I close off the entrance so that it's not going to migrate up. If it's through a scrotal incision, meaning we already did something else, you know, it was, you know, the testis sparing turned into a radical orchiectomy because, you know, you didn't have whatever you needed, margins, whatnot. It's still okay. You just have to make sure you have a high scrotal incision because you don't want it to erode through a middle incision. And then again, I have all of them pulled down on the incision daily. Um, what are the indications? Hold on, there's one person asking a question here. Um, what are the indications for testicular biopsy in patients with leukemia? So we don't as a standard biopsy them if they have known leukemia and they happen to have masses there, you'll often see them involute. The only time we are asked to perform the biopsy is if we need to confirm relapse and they have no other site. And so then they're asking us, you know, we need to go in there and say, is that the site that's protected um, to confirm the relapse? And they've been in remission. What is your opinion on testicular calcifications as an indication for testicular biopsy? That's a great question. I think the study that I talked about here where it shows the significantly increased risk of cancer in, pre in kids with microlithiasis 
I wouldn't necessarily take them for a biopsy just to see if they have ITGCN and then how is it going to change your management, but certainly it may lead to more screening. Ultrasounds are great. They're cheap, non-invasive, non-radiating, no IVs necessary, and very easy for a tech to perform across the board and send images elsewhere if there were questions. So I wouldn't necessarily do a biopsy just for the calcifications, but certainly follow them closer. Next question on here is, when to perform testis sparing surgery in a post-pubertal boy and negative tumor markers? Another great question because this is actually in the adult literature as well, and they're very supportive of doing testis sparing surgery, and I know Dr. Saltzman will talk about this when we have our live session as well, but supportive of doing it if they have a testicle, a testicular tumor that's two centimeters or less with the negative margins, and if it's a polar mass rather than it's going to be taking up, you know, most of the middle of the testicle. So it's, it's definitely something to consider, you know, if you have ultrasound guidance during the case that will help as well, because again, you don't want to enter the tumor. We do needle localization here as well. So you have the probe and you can put the needle underneath the tumor, not through the tumor, and make sure that you're getting all of it out at once. Because again, the goal is on block. If you can't do on block, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't do the testis sparing surgery. But it's certainly an option with negative markers, even though they're postpubertal, as long as you deliver it through the inguinal incision, you're clamping the cord, you've got everything blanketed out just like you would for a radical, so that in the event your frozen section comes back as something that you weren't expecting, you can convert it right then and there to a radical and not be worried about spillage or anything like that. Next question, do you have any idea how much sperm baking costs? A rough estimate would be nice for counseling. That's a great question and it comes up all the time when we do our oncofertility counseling uh, for our pre and our post So most sperm banking, if it's only sperm, it can be about $120 a year for the bank that we have around here. If it's tissue, it can be more on the, on the edge of $600 a year. And so it depends if you're outsourcing it to a freezer elsewhere, if you have it on site. A lot of places when you have an on site freezer, it can be a little less expensive um, versus having to ship it out elsewhere and it's stored off site. A lot of families like the idea of on site storage because you've heard horror stories of the truck that goes off the ditch or it got sidelined and then the freezer went down elsewhere, they lost power. And so they want to trust that they know where their tissue or where their sperm is. So they like to know if it's on site, they want to know where it's stored. So that's the, the overall cost that we have in this area, somewhere between $120 and $600. Next question. In your experience, most masses can be removed in a testicular sparing manner. Um, and then would it be safe to send a frozen section in all masses and then decide orchiectomy versus partial? And Yes, I would say I would say yes to both of those in the prepubertal kids with the negative margins where I go into the case to say, I think I can do this testis sparing, then yes, it ends up being successful testis sparing. Uh, if it's, you know, frozen section comes back and then decide, absolutely, that's what frozen section is for. Um, again, the conversion rate from one diagnosis to the other or the discordant rate for your pathology for testis tumors is extremely, extremely low. It's not, you know, like, you know, some other cancers where it's kind of, you know, we have to do extra stains in this, you know, our pathologists are really good at, you know, finding the diagnosis. And then again, margins being margins, they can get that um, very accurately. And so I would say, absolutely, if you can send frozen section in your mass and then decide after that, as long as you haven't compromised the oncologic um, surgery itself. Next one. How to do a biopsy for possible leukemia is needle acceptable? Yes, there are certainly places that do needle biopsies for that. You know, for kids, you're still putting them, you know, essentially to sleep or with conscious sedation. Um, the oncologists want to make sure they have enough tissue. So the worst thing you can do is give a kid sedation or they're intubated in, in the sleep. And then we still don't have a diagnosis. And so I think the, you know, the, the ones that I've been involved in, we've actually taken a small wedge biopsy and they were asleep for something else as well. Maybe they were getting their um, spinal tap or they were getting bone marrow biopsy. And so you try to combine it with another anesthetic, but you want to make sure you get the answer. So that's another situation where we send it off for frozen section and they can see. The trouble with the needle biopsy is a lot of times these can be little nodules throughout the testicle and you can absolutely just miss it with the needle. 
Um, the bleeding risk afterwards is not small. You know, some of these kids have low platelets and such. And so, you know, you never want to operate with low platelets or low counts if you can help it, but at least you can control with cautery and make sure you're closing the uh, albuginia well. And so, in my experience, what we've done is, is the open biopsies where you're taking just a small piece of tissue but closing everything up. There was another question um, that I saw up here in the chat. So let me open that one. Um, how to follow kids with microlithiasis. This is such an unknown. It would be a great project for somebody who's got 20, 25 years left in their career. So a great multi-institutional study where, you know, there's no right answer for how to follow kids with microlithiasis based on this one study. But when we look at growth of tumors, you know, for kidneys, there's great data. They say, oh, if it's, you know, three millimeters a year, you can, you can image at these intervals. We just don't have that for testis, and we certainly don't have it for kids. So it's kind of hard. You know, we're, we always want to make sure that we don't lose kids to follow up. So once a year visits seem to be a reasonable period of time that you would notice any change, as long as they're doing their self-exams once a month in the shower if they're pubertal. For the earlier kids, they're coming in for the well-child visits once a year anyway. It's easy enough to throw an ultrasound on there. Again, as long as insurance is covering it and it's not depleting our healthcare system, which I don't think it is, I think it's very reasonable if somebody had bilateral microlithiasis in a child early in life and you hung your hat on this study and said, wow, look at that odds ratio, I want to watch this kid, that an ultrasound should be something that we can easily write a letter of medical necessity to the insurance companies and say, you know, we're doing this for surveillance purposes. We also don't want to give them a pre-existing diagnosis of we're worried about cancer, but it's certainly something that you're watching. It's just, you know, something that is unknown right now, but that's probably how we're going to get our answer. And if it's something that ends up being Q2 years until puberty and then yearly after that, because it may be more prevalent, that might be it. But I think we, you know, if somebody was interested in, in starting up a multi-institutional study, this would be low-hanging fruit, if you will. Any other questions about anything with testicular tumors? Life in general, the weather in Rochester. <laughs> it's very odd to not have voices kind of going back and forth, so I'm trusting that you're chuckling at my bad jokes and, and smiling and happy and enjoying a glass of water with, with this lovely discussion, so. And I'll stay on for a while just in case other people pop on. But I think the, um, you know, the, the SPU live that's happening that same weekend of AUA, especially for people that are interested in peds, it's an awesome session that's, that's going to be all day and you can kind of pop in and out. They'll all be recorded and then you can view them later. Of course, it's the changeover weekend of residency where, you know, chiefs are moving on and people are moving for fellowships and people are signing over services for the weekend right before the 1st of July. So it's kind of a tough weekend, but it's what worked for, for AUA and SPU. We're lucky to be tagged on to them uh, to keep our, our society going in the spring. So I think it's something that if you, if you had any other questions or you had specific cases you want to discuss, by all means, send me an email. You know, my Twitter handle is on there, but I'm happy to share my email with everybody. It's just grandberg.candice at mayo.edu and happy to be a resource if anyone has any questions about oncofertility or, you know, just, you know, rare cases pop up here and there. We really lean on our colleagues when these things come up, you know, for kids, it's like, you know, you might see something once in your career and you're really kind of leaning on your, your friends and friends and colleagues for, for assistance in how to approach things. So. Um, another one just came in again about the management or follow-up that you give to children with microlithiasis at your center. Again, it's definitely not an open study, not recruiting anybody on any protocols by any means, but if I do get a kid referred to me with bilateral microlithiasis, we are following them with an ultrasound at least once a year for the first few years to see is it progressive, are there any masses, um, and ensuring that they're going to be of the age and maturity that they can do self-exams. And so Again, I think it's something that would be a very easy study to put together moving forward because we now have that study that says, look, there's an increased risk, which flies in the face of the adult data that says there's no increased risk with microlithiasis. So that if the insurance companies came back and said, we're not covering that, you know, because there's no increased risk of cancer, what are you doing? We can certainly say, but for kids, it looks like there is. So this is why we're following them. So something that we could certainly consider 
um, working together. Undescended testicles and tumors, do you believe in a strong relation? So that's another great question. There's, there's studies from kind of all over the place. There was a study from, um, I want to say it was Sweden or Switzerland, where they looked at 16,000 men with undescended testicle, and then they underwent their orchiopexy, you know, pre-puberty, and their risk of cancer was 0.3%. And so, you know, if you look at that overall and say, wow, that's really low, but it was still higher than the general population or a control population. And so it's certainly, you know, a risk factor. And so the higher up the testicle, the higher the risk is believed to be. Um, it's just more abnormal that the testicle is. And then it can certainly be at a higher risk, again, at the higher temperature, it's sitting higher. So there's multiple studies looking at position of the testicle, age at bringing the testicle down, again, bringing it down before puberty seems to decrease the risk of subsequent cancer. And so it's definitely the number one thing pediatricians are taught because that's what they tell the families before they send to us for their orchiopexy is you've got to take this down because of cancer. It doesn't decrease the risk necessarily, but it puts it in a position where they can do their self exams. And so, you know, we certainly do talk about the risk of cancer. We're not telling them that we're curing them by doing their orchiopexy, but we certainly do put it down, you know, for their self exam. You know, the reason we put it down early in life is so they don't lose their germ cells so that they have germ cell function because that's been shown to go down around 18 months of age, understanding that it's probably a bell curve and you could lose some earlier than that. So the AUA guideline recommends that you bring it down between six and 12 months. And so, you know, as far as quoting parents exact percentages, it's hard. It's dependent on, you know, their ethnicity. It's dependent on, um, you know, the age at their orchiopexy. It's dependent on position, you know, unilateral versus bilateral. So it's certainly something that we talk about, but I rarely throw percentages at parents. A lot of them don't understand it anyway, but what we do tell them is we're doing this for fertility, for function, and to put it in a position where they can do self-exams once a month in the shower when they hit puberty. Anything else? Any East Coasters out there? Gosh, it's probably later out there and and it's a weeknight. Thank you for thank you to everybody for listening. I think it's great that we can we can meet like this and continue learning from each other and putting it into archives so people can watch and I think it's fantastic. I wish this would have been around when I was a resident and a fellow. I think it's fantastic to have a a library of things you can refer to down the road when you say, gosh, I'm studying for the in-service. I really want to learn more about you know, DSD or, you know, Wilms tumor or something, you'll have a nice, nicely put together PowerPoint that you can clip right through or watch the video. So it's great. Big props to Dr. Kopp and everybody at UCSF for putting this together quickly. I mean, this was fast. All of a sudden it was like things are shut down and hey, let's learn. And so, you know, all of us across the country that, that wanted to give talks were clamoring at the opportunity because we want to help and I think it's it's amazing that we have this platform that we can do this and you know people are doing visiting professors they're doing you know educational conferences and and we're quite lucky that we are having this happen now versus you know in a time where we didn't have the the technical capabilities to do it any burning research questions fellowship questions we don't have a fellowship here so i have no no nowhere to learn to to give any preference to I just am always available as a resource of life research ninja anything <laughs> none of our gyms are open here so we're not doing much ninja warrior so Okay, so I think we'll probably call it a day. I do want to thank Michelle. She was fantastic in getting everything set up. She's going to take care of putting the slides somewhere for everybody. Um, again, thank you everybody for joining. It's great to, to be able to meet everybody virtually. Hopefully I can get a list of everyone who's there and send you a little thank you or something. So I'll talk to Michelle about that. But again, thank you very much. Um, enjoy your time. Stay safe. Stay healthy. And please don't hesitate to reach out by Twitter, by email. Granberg.candice at mayo.edu if you have any questions. So thanks a lot.